This is Anthony with MakeWeirdMusic.com, and I have a very special guest today. It's David Singleton, all the way from England. Thank you so much for joining. Um, so, we met last night yes. and had a great conversation about music. Uh, I'd love to continue that, but can you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about uh, what you do yep. uh, well, for yourself and for... Well, I'm David, and... Um... Probably the main thing I do is I run DGM, which is the, it's not really a label, but the company that I run together with Robert Fripp, uh, which we started in 1993 as a way of bringing music into the world and trying to solve the always clumsy relationship between music and commerce. Mm. That's really our core, our core being is to try and find ways of honoring the music, bring the music into the world and um, trying to ensure that people, if there is money, that artists get paid correctly. Um, so we started that in 1993, and we're still at it. We, we handled King Crim well, we handled three artists, actually. We formally handled King Crimson, uh, Robert Fripp, and the Vicar. So, in effect, we handled King Crimson and then the, the, the personal music of Robert and me. That's probably the best way to put it. Um, and um, I don't think we're perfect, but I think over the years we've found... Uh, fairly good ways of accommodating the <laughs> the dilemma because actually it isn't simple music um, music really has to be made for the right reasons which are artistic reasons and therefore um, I think when music is driven by commerce rather than the other way around it's often isn't perfect um, so it's uh, it's always challenging actually trying to find out how you how you marry the two but um, that rough that roughly is what I do and and, and my background is as, as a songwriter and producer and um, so that's, that's where it comes from. So I listened to uh, The Vicar mm -hmm. Storybook Number yep. One. Yep. I loved it. Yep. I heard lots of <laughs> lots of influences yep. from Andy Partridge of XTC yes. to some Gentle Giant yep. to The Beatles. Uh, can you talk a little about your your musical background and um, and well, your okay. involvement with The Vicar? Okay, so, so okay, so that, that's that's a The Vicar is a fascinating. Uh, project. So I'm. I'm. My background is a songwriter, uh -huh. and most of the songs on that album I wrote about 20 years ago. Hmm. Um, in fact, there's a song on there called 22 that I wrote when I was 22. Ah. Um, and uh, at the time, I was trying to write songs, thinking that other people might play them, and um, I was never. I never liked any of the results, loosely. So I wrote the songs, and I. I didn't know how to produce them and nobody else was playing them in a way I liked. Mm. Um, and um, so when I revisited them more recently, I surprisingly, um, I discovered that the person who could actually arrange and produce the songs that the 22-year-old 22, 22 David could write was actually me. <laughs> in the future. Me in the future. <laughs> so so in, in fact, the, the Vicar really is a strange collaboration between a younger me and an older me. Oh. And the... Um, which I, both parts of which I think are very valid. I, I think generally, um, younger people I think write very good pop songs. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a, a simplicity and an idealism or whatever that is very difficult to catch. As you, as you get older, it's harder and harder I think mm -hmm. to write very good songs. In fact, if you look at most of the things that most of us sing from the artists we love, actually most of them were done before they were thirty probably. Yeah. Um, whereas actually after that you develop other skills that are just as important, particularly musical skills and production skills. So in fact, I, I love this collision between me. Here's, here's a raw thing that I wrote. A, a lot of it I did change, but there was a raw genesis written then, and you produce it. And uh, um, with one or two of the songs, they were very changed. I always laugh about there's the, it's the story of the broom, isn't it? When someone says, I've never replaced my broom mm -hmm. ever. All I've done is I've replaced the head five times and the handle four, four times, but I've, I've never replaced my broom. And to some extent, I've always said there is no such thing as a bad song. There might be a bad melody and a bad lyric and a bad arrangement, but there's no such thing. As that. So you just change all of those and you've probably got a good song. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so some of those songs have been slightly reinvented since the 22 year old me wrote them. But, yeah. Did you write them with the orchestration in mind? Because it, it's so, there's um, so much going on. I, I heard, oh gosh, no and yes and no, okay, is the answer. So when I was young, I couldn't have conceived of those exact orchestrations. I wouldn't have been able, I wouldn't have been good enough, I think, to write them. But 
some of those songs had been done, you know, hey, let's, let's, you know, bass, drums, guitar, and I thought they died. There are people have played some, and I, they, they just weren't, in, they were never intended to be written like, played like that. Mm -hmm. And so the, the big decision with the Vickle album, which I didn't realize was as large, was the fact there are no drums on it. Yeah. And um, that was a conscious decision, partly because actually I hate it when you, because if you have drums on something, particularly if you're, working toward media you, you start by laying down a click track and you end up with this mechanical thing that everybody's playing to and I've always hated that and I realized that actually I don't hear drums in my head um, this is a fault with me I'd like to point out so if I ran a Beatles song for example in my head now I can run you I don't know Penny Lane mm -hmm. you know I can hear Penny Lane in my head I could talk to you about all the instruments and I would tell you and I oddly enough I wouldn't ever mention the fact that they're the drums right um, that's not true of all Beatles songs, actually, you know, Strawberry Fields or something. You can, I, but, but a lot, most Beatles songs, I realise I can run them and I can, I hear the orchestra. I'll talk to you about, you know, what the guitars are doing, what the piano is doing, what the wonderful orchestration is doing. But I don't hear the drums in my head. Even in something like Come Together. Well, no, that, I said okay. that there, are, there, there are there are there are ones when the drums are such a theme. That's why right. I said Strawberry Fields. Actually, there are there are ones, but a lot of them, yeah. I suppose, when the drums are just holding the back beat, I, I sort of take it for granted, but I don't run it in my head. Uh -huh. And so I thought, well, so rather than this rule of okay we, we're going to be guided by drums let's imagine there are no drums and really the all of the orchestrations in the album were as a result of that one decision yeah. because the moment you take the drums away now it's great fun and actually suddenly your string part or whatever has got to fill in for what your drums would have been doing right. for carrying the beat right and particularly, so, so I didn't really want to have any strum guitars. The, 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 I didn't really want to have any strum guitars or drums. So nothing. There's nothing just solidly strong carrying the beat. And um, the album was what it was because of that very simple decision. Um, and um, I'm a huge Beatle fan, but I think a lot of the reason people hear it, even in the songs that I don't think are particularly Beatlesque, actually, and they say, "Oh, but it's so Beatlesque," and I think that's simply because. There aren't that many people who've done that. I mean, Eleanor Rigby, you know, is a right. classic example. But there aren't a lot of artists who've gone away and done things that are obviously pop songs, but sitting, you know, without that. And Andy Partridge also goes into interesting um, land. And uh, um, uh, oddly enough, I, I wanted him to sing, originally I wanted him to sing The Girl with the Sunshine in Her Eyes. Yeah. I may yet persuade him. Um, but Andy, Andy isn't really comfortable singing other people's stuff, so. We'll see, but I'm I'm still working on him for the songbook number two. I'm working on Andy because it's it's an obvious match. And how did you get into um, production and audio engineering and mixing and all that? In the first place, yeah. um, there's not the, much history. I've, it's just kind of like this is what he does. Okay, I've I've well, it's odd because I've always done it. Um, I my background is as a as a, as a musician who doesn't like practicing. Mm. That's probably. <laughs> That's where I started. I was like that at school. I used to play instruments for about a year or two. And once I thought, I sort of, okay, I sort of understand that instrument. I had no instrument. It, I, I wanted to compose for it, but I wasn't interested in being able to play it. So I, you know, I played the cello for two years. I played the French horn for, for a couple of years. Well, actually, that's probably the one I played better, but I played the French horn for a bit. I played the piano actually quite a bit. I played, mm -hmm. the, so, um, I played the flute for a bit, I think. And, um, and lo and behold, at some point or other, I went, yes, you really, you should be the conductor. <laughs> <laughs> so, so actually, in sort of really bad orchestras, when I was at school, I used to conduct because you know I, I roughly understood all the instruments and I could understand the, the arrangements, but I couldn't play them very well. And um, then I started playing in bands, and I used to play bass in bands. Um, and similarly, because I had an overview, you end up producing. You end up saying, "Okay, well, I'll produce it." Right. So. Um, that's why I first met Robert. Actually, I really started as a sound engineer with Robert. But actually, I was never, other than for him, I was never a sound engineer. I was really a producer who... Um, so I started as a songwriter who became a producer, and then you drift into sound engineering, I think partly because it's where the money is. It's, it's, it, the technology drove us like that. So, you know, the day when you were a producer and you sat in a studio, which I used to do with a, an engineer in front of you, was great. But actually, after a while... Um, as budgets either were tighter or as things moved into computers, people said, well, actually, you know, you're now, you know, you're now the producer and the sound engineer. Right. You know, they're, they're, it's the same job. Do them both. So, and so when I very first met Robert, it was purely actually as a sound engineer to mix a tour. And, um, 
I think the very next album I worked on was Sunday All Over the World. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I, I remember because they were struggling with the sequencing of it. And I remember saying to him, well, you know, try this sequence. And he said, oh, OK, so you're not really a sound engineer. I can remember, I can remember him saying, I said, oh, so. <laughs> um, uh, so that, that was really my background. And the um, uh, Robert has always said that it was inevitable that we would probably meet because he's from Dorset. And I was running a small independent mobile studio in Dorset. Mm. And he said, well, actually, it's a very small county. So, you know, <laughs> hopefully, if both of us were good at our jobs, it was right. pretty inevitable at some point or other we would come into the same orbit. Right. And now you run a record label yep. together. How has the transition been for you to go from <laughs> music creation to... <laughs> so I think um, I'm still in denial about the... Um, a suit part of my job. I was told the other day, David, you've become a suit, somebody told me. <laughs> and I'm still in denial about that part of the job. Um, and the label itself went through a cycle of being a label and we stopped. So so DJM, we started with this, you know, let's, let's start a label and try and bring, you know, work out how you might bring music into the world, put it, place it into the world without it having to obey market constructs. So when we make an album, Frack Attack is a perfect example. I don't think any major label. I don't, I'm assuming here, by the way, that some of these people will know what I'm talking about. But yeah, it's, it's an album based of King Crimson improvisation for one hour. And I don't think any sane record label would have said, this is a really good commercial release. That's the one you should make. So that's, but actually, DJM, that's not what we did. We just thought, well, this is, this is the album we should make. We'll make it. And once we've made it, we'll work out how we might place it into the world. Mm -hmm. um, so we were doing that. And because possibly we were doing it reasonably well, um, other people were keen we did it for them so uh, there was a period of DGM about the first five or six years possibly a bit younger when it um, it kept expanding so we had you know we had King Crimson then we had the solo albums so we had Tony Levin's solo albums Bill Bruford's solo albums uh, we had John Paul Jones um, and this was fine and there was a point when I realised I now got out of bed and all I did was I ran a label and we had 25 empl 20 employees and we, we had offices in LA and whatever and I said this is this is not what I <laughs> this is not what I set out to be you can't pretend I, anymore. I can't <laughs> pretend anymore and I don't like it and this is this is taking me away from what it, what what I'm put on the planet to do so um, we fortunately we quietly persuaded everyone that they might like to find another home uh -huh. I mean, in a nice way we, we said you know we, we and we moved DGM to what it is currently which said is just King Crimson, Robert Fripp and the Vicar. And and that's wonderfully liberating. I still get a lot of calls from people saying, Oh, you know, you're a label, I want you to do this. And we mm -hmm. say, Well, that's that's not the business we're in now. This is this is what we do, because otherwise, you know, yes, I am a suit trying to solve your problems for you. <laughs> and I'm not that's not the business I'm in. And last night you talked about bucking the trend of the industry. Can yep. you tell us a little about how like what that means okay. and how you're getting okay there. so uh, what, what I meant by bucking the trend we were, we were discussing <laughs> how, how you make a living out of music and generally um, music sales have been falling um, downloads actually I think are doing okay but certainly overall certainly um, physical sales have been falling mm -hmm. if you go talk to any of the major labels for a long while and ours are rising and uh, personally I don't think that's surprising I think that there are perfectly good sales out there provided you want to do some work, um, which I have told the major labels quite when, when we go to conferences. In other words, if you want to be lazy and sack everybody and accept, you know, I own this CD and all I want to do is just carry on selling this exact CD tomorrow, you won't. Mm -hmm. You know, those sales are disappearing and people are now m moving and downloading them or streaming them or even actually not, not stealing them as much as they were actually. In truth, right. But um, uh, whereas if you're willing to add value and create things that people want to buy, there's a very good physical market out there. So the the two things really we've done is, the first one is that the whole catalogue has been remixed, well, it's been remastered and remixed and put out in surround sound. So that's one. And every Christmas, we've been doing a box set, working through the albums. And similarly, this isn't um, probably a good example of what I meant about how you live with the market. This isn't a sort of a, a, a crass, we can make some money by putting the album in a box, which I know some of the major labels have tried and discovered it doesn't. As you know, I'll, 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 you know, here it is and we'll give you a brochure and we'll stick in an extra CD of this and here's right. your box. Whereas actually we've done the reverse and we said, okay, we'll look at this period and you know, we'll empty our archives and we'll lovingly redo them. So I think the road to Redbox then had about 24 CDs of all the shows from, from that tour, plus the album, plus the album in surround sound and 
you know, a booklet that has all the pictures. So if you're willing to seriously honour each of the albums and go through and present each of the periods well, they work very well. And um, uh, just to show how little we... <laughs> How little we really allow the finances to run our world. It wasn't until we'd done quite a few of those boxes that I realised, you know, that actually we unwittingly created a fairly major grossing item. I mean, the, we the, most of them are ten thousand, roughly ten thousand limited run. We can only make these things one. So we make about ten thousand of each of those boxes, and they all sell for somewhere around the hundred dollar range, depending on quite how many CDs we've had to put in. Right. But actually, I, it was, I just did the Sounds for Robert one morning. I said, well, actually, you realize we just every Christmas we've got a million dollar grossing item we're putting out. Mm. That's fantastic. You know, <laughs> in a world where apparently physical sales don't exist anymore. Right. And uh, you set, you had a great statement. Well, great, depending <laughs> on who you ask. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the world doesn't owe creative people a, a living. living. No, I, I think, sad that was the other thing we were discussing. It's And it's... It's it's very difficult, I think, because I think a lot of people look at the world and there are artists out there making a living. And but equally well, um, I don't think the world does own. That, that's part of why I think the the join between art and commerce is so complicated. And you can be a very very talented musician, and the world doesn't owe you a living. Mm -hmm. um, the um, and you, you and then each person has to come up with their answer to how they solve that problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I've done it, you know, I suffer from that with the vicar, you know, I, I've slaved on, you know, <laughs> the vicar, I suppose, is my genuine heart, lifelong project. And um, I've long since let go of the fact that the vicar owes me a living. I mean, I, I'm dying to find ways of finding ears to listen to it. Mm -hmm. But I don't think, hey, wow, I'm going to become a rock star and the world's going to buy the vicar. Right. It's, um, and if you go back in history, you know, the, the Actually, most of the composers probably were, had day jobs. They were either teachers or taxi drivers, or you know. So um, uh, there is a living to be made. Um, oddly enough, I followed up on that conversation this morning uh, with Robert. I was summarising what we discussed, mm -hmm. and um, I'd realised there was a, another way of expressing it, which I didn't use last night. But actually, um, there is a difference, I think, between musicians and artists. Um, but you have to find those two terms. But there is, and actually, um, artists the world will often give a living to, yeah. but musicians it often won't. And so you can be one of the greatest musicians in the world, and 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 often artists, are ironically, maybe technically a less good musician. But by, by what I meant by artists is the speak the people who somehow speak to the soul of the world. You know, it's why. Uh, whoever, whoever it is who floats your boat, mm -hmm. they're the artist that speaks to your soul. Mm -hmm. those, those people generally are giving some people something they need. And if you're giving some people something they need, they usually will pay for it in to some degree. Right. Whereas, um, sadly, well, not sadly, but, you know, there are a lot of other people who are called to music and who are just as passionate about, you know, I have to, I have to do music, music is what I am. But um, it doesn't it doesn't owe us all a living. Um, Yep. And DGM just put Radical Action out on Spotify. Yep. And for any King Crimson fan, <laughs> it was like almost sacrilegious. Yes. Like, how could this possibly... Yep. And can you talk a little about the, the years of... Well, actually, actually I'll, I'll, I'll put it, the, the, the wonderful thing about that with Spotify um, is that um, when we eventually... I'll come to why we did it, but actually I, I've had at least five emails from Spotify... <laughs> saying, excuse me, are you sure? Can we really put this up? Because we have spent so long berating them for doing it illegally that when, when, when they were finally offered it, they were, I think they were terrified to actually put it up. Um, yeah. and Suing I, a record label? Well, 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 oddly enough, I think we missed a trick because actually the one people we never... Well, I don't like... We don't like suing people. But the, the one people we never chased for money were, were Spotify, who did several times put up King Crimson illegally. And I was being told this morning it was a band I didn't know, so they can't be that large. I've just settled out of court for millions with Spotify mm. for the fact that they did use their music illegally. So maybe I should have continued. A, a few years ago, I, long before we were even on iTunes, when we were a complete digital music stop out, um, we weren't in downloads, we weren't on streaming, we weren't on anything, and um, we were at a conference with EMI, who were at the time the old Virgin EMI, and they asked us about our digital music strategy, and I said, I have a more profitable music digital strategy than any of you. My, my strategy is quite simple. We don't put it anywhere. We wait until one of you puts it up illegally, and then we sue you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
um, yeah. which for a while was an incredibly successful policy. <laughs> uh, um, uh, but anyway, so but the, the download world matured into a world where you thought, you know, this is somewhere we should be. Uh -huh. And the, the streaming world is more nuanced. So within the you know, various people who contribute to the conversations within DGM, it, Spotify remains a hot topic. Mm -hmm. And the... What's the spectrum of views? The spectrum, well, the, spe the, hard, the, the biggest fear on the left, probably from the people who do our physical distribution, is that it might carve into our physical sales. Mm -hmm. And the, the danger of that is that physical sales require volume. So if, if you lose 10% of your physical sales, you possibly lose all of them. Because you know, what happens with distributors is if they're ordering enough, if, if you've got enough stuff, they order and they buy stuff. Mm -hmm. But actually, it doesn't have to drop before much before it's not worth sending a lorry at all anymore. So now we just don't send the lorry. Mm -hmm. Stop. So there's always been a fear, does streaming um, you know, eat into physical sales? And my feeling for a long time has been that actually it's just two completely different markets. And the one will not pillage the other. So and you're on the other so, end so, of the so, 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 I, so I'm on the I'm on the spectrum of actually I think we should be doing this. I don't believe it's going to eat into it. Mm -hmm. In the middle, I think Robert has always been uncomfortable simply with the, the, the money flow back out of Spotify. Not is it simply, you know, is it right that suddenly you can have... Um, Perhaps I shouldn't name him out here because I don't know if he wants to be named, but I was speaking to a very famous producer the other day who... Um, has had 14 million downloads last year and was sent a check for a thousand dollars from Spotify. Yeah. You know, so there is an argument that says, is you know, is Spotify playing its fair way? The so what we've done, I, and I, I, however, my my fam, my children are all Spotify users. I have a young family; they're all Spotify users. And for Christmas, my son gave me Spotify. I suspect I gave myself Spotify. I'm probably paying for it, but anyway, but he gave me Spotify, you know, and, and he set me up so that on my iPad I can play it, and I've got a speaker in the sitting room. So, oh, you play, want to play that? Play it on anything? Out, out, you know, it comes yeah. out of the speaker. And I've always maintained that I think a music library, subscribing to a music library, is one of the ways that we will all enjoy music, mm -hmm. and it's wonderful. I mean, I went to see La La Land. I don't know if you've been to see La La Land. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I was a lover of La La Land musically. I was a lover. Of it. So I came back. You know, it's great on a high. We just seen it. Came back at ten o'clock at night. Went onto my iPad, played La La Land, and danced around the sitting room to like, you know, what, why, why is this not, why is this not a wonderful thing to do? Right. And so it seemed to me that it was slightly perverse that in my home life I was doing this, and in my professional life I was saying, but you can't do it with King Crimson. So the uh, the compromise situation seemed to be that we would put radical action onto Spotify because it doesn't risk suddenly. You know, in the Court of the Crimson King, hey, no one's buying it anymore because it's now on Spotify. Um, if I'm right, we will add Court of the Crimson King because I will then be able to show that it doesn't mess up with the physical sales. But um, with Radical Action, um, it's there. Um, if, if you've gone to see the concert last night, hey, you can go and listen to roughly what it was. If young young kids want to talk, you know, you should listen to King Crimson. There's King Crimson out there. Mm -hmm. And actually, I love the fact that the King Crimson that's out there is the new band not something historic? I love the fact that if someone goes, they used to listen to King Crimson, if you did on Spotify, okay. what you'll get to hear is this band, yeah. not a band from 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, uh, in fact, uh, the same thing's true. We've been adding tracks to YouTube, and I love, uh, I think, uh, Starless has just hit 2 million, um, which is a lot, lot of views for King Crimson. And I love the fact that actually the highest viewed item on YouTube, where there is quite a lot of historic King Crimson, is a brand new track by the brand new band. Right. So, That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what uh, what's happening with the rest of the Vickers work? Okay, the, the Vickers. It's a whole. It's not just the CD. No, so, so, so graphic I, novel. No, so, so the the irony of the Vicar is that me, the songwriter, I you know I cut my core. I think I'm I'm a writer certainly. Well, I'm, a, I'm both a word writer and a songwriter. But I wrote those songs, and um, I actually the excuse to finally make an album was because I wrote a series of books. So the. Um, the core of the vicar. The vicar, it's a series roughly, it's whodunits in the music industry. It's all these wonderful stories about corruption that you hear about um, and based around uh, the character of the vicar who's a music producer and his, um, his assistant, Punk Sanderson, who writes the books. Who's the far character. Wit yeah, who's far <laughs> wittier and more obscene than I would ever dare be. Right, so, um, and uh, the genesis of that, actually, I was in a studio with Robert and somebody called and as usual, it was some horrendous story about, you know, Someone had been ripped off or mm -hmm. um, whatever. 
And I turned around to him and said, why has no one written who done it's about the music business. I mean, it's just a, you know, wonderful thing to set a stories in, and all these stories, all these stories exist. And this voice came from behind me because of what was sitting behind me said, because you haven't written them yet. <laughs> um, which was the challenge I took. So um, I wrote the first Vicar book, which was actually published as a diary online, and then the second one, and the, the two of them were put together into the, um, a, a book that we put out, and. I realized that actually having created the, the character of the vicar, which is a whole world of you know, semi, semi-fictional real world, whatever you want to put it, um, that now this was this wonderful opportunity that the vicar could make an album. Mm-hmm. And um, it's very weird. Um, I'm not gonna, you, you start saying things when you realize, hold on, I'm saying things that yeah. sound a bit odd now. <laughs> but um, ironically, Punk Sanderson, who writes the vicar books, Um, Punk Sanderson writes a much better book than I write. Uh. I've written books by David Singleton and Punk Sanderson writes, although I am Punk Sanderson, (laughs) Punk Sanderson writes a much better book than I write. And I've considered previously several times, in fact, the height of DGM, I considered lots of times putting out a David Singleton solo album and I thought, well, what's the point and why is anyone interested? And The Vicar, even though I am The Vicar, produces a much better album than David Singleton would produce. And I, I know that probably sounds slightly screwy, but it's undoubtedly true. Um, the there was something about the whole uh, the vicar. Thing. Partly the character was well defined, so that actually that even that fed into the album has is going to have a particular English sensibility because that's how the, who the character of the vicar is. Um, but it was liberating, and had I approached it as a David Singleton solo album, it would not be anywhere close to the album that it is. And last night you mentioned one of the biggest challenges is actually not selling, but finding an audience. Yes. And I, oddly enough, I think that was... Um, I'm boring your viewers now. <laughs> we're, no, talking no. About a, we're talking about a conversation that you weren't party to last night. <laughs> actually, uh, the, the viewers love like, okay. in-depth, long so, things. So, so, so yeah. you're, 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 you're hearing the second half of a conversation at the dinner table that you weren't there for. Yeah. But I, I, yes, I came away from last night, oddly enough, thinking that we didn't have at the table... I think the more challenging, the more interesting half of the conversation. So a lot of people are talking about, you know, roughly how do how do we make a living out of music? To which the answer is you don't. <laughs> um, uh, but no, but we had a lot of conversations about that. But actually, I think that the other half of DGM is more interesting and more challenging because there are two halves of it. One one half is was to try and make the commerce work as well as we could, but the other half is simply to bring music into the world and to try and find an audience. And ironically, we never tapped really on that last night, which is, right. and I, I don't have any secret, I'm very fortunate, I don't have any secret <laughs> answers to this. If I did, you'd have all have heard the Vicar album by now. Um, but the, um, and I think that is a much more interesting challenge. And I think that the, the way that the music world is going, actually, that is quite exciting. So the same way that you can get quite depressed about, you know, how do I make a living? Um, I think there are more opportunities now for artists to be heard than probably there ever have been. Yeah. There's a lot of noise out there, but I think there probably always was, and you have to rise above it. And yes, um, uh, I think the um, uh, uh, similarly, Robert said to me this morning when I was paraphrasing, ourselves, he said, the, the difficult thing to learn in life is that you may choose music, but that music may not choose you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> which is Which is harsh, but there is a point at which you know, some people make great records and they just don't, they aren't, new, they, they aren't the type of music that goes and speaks to, you know, to a huge audience in a wonderful mm-hmm. way, mm-hmm. which is very horrible. But the, um, but assuming that, you know, we're assuming here that maybe we've made a record that, you know, um, for which there is an audience and there is an audience that would like it, which, right. I, which I believe about the Vicar heartedly, <laughs> by the way. Otherwise, it wouldn't, I, I do. I, I, cut I agree. Me, cut me and I believe, you know, I, so yeah. um, I think there is a, there are more ways out there now than there have ever been um, for you to go and do it. And it's it's just as tough as it's ever been because there is a lot of noise out there. But the playing but, field is so but, much more level. Exactly. So previously, really, unless you had a major record deal, it was a non-starter. And the the irony of the vicar, ironically, is that you know when I was 22, 23, had EMI come along and I'd cut their hands off and say, oh, David, you want to do this? You'd have said, God, thank you. <laughs> and um, just when I had just about finished doing the vicar songbook number one, um, I started having conversations about EMI about did they want to license it mm. and 
I suddenly realized we were having a conversation that was pointless because you were thinking, well, what is it, what what are you going to offer me now right. that I don't have? I've made the I, I can make the record. You know, you you're, you don't you're not telling me that you don't have a secret answer to how we promote it. So actually, what is your role in this? Right. Um, so in that, and you're right. So it is a much more level playing field where it used to be unless you've got a you know a huge major behind you, really nothing is going to happen. Mm. Whereas the likes of Spotify and YouTube and social media, it is a much more level playing field. Just I said it's not there's no answers and obviously there are no answers because if there was an answer everybody would try it and then it would stop being the answer again <laughs> you know so, so the moment somebody right. does something clever and they oh that worked well it'll never work again because everybody's doing the same thing now yeah. so um, but I think if you've got the right music it, it is a so the same the same things that I think make music challenging financially actually open up avenues for people to hear music which overall means that I think they're, all these things are therefore good for music. Right. Um, because I think the, the um, music and the music, in, the, the music business is always a clumsy construct. Yeah. It's, it's better out of the way. In a funny way, if, if, if the music can flow, that's wonderful. Artists don't like being ripped off. I mean, that's Robert. So, the, the, you know, the core of DGM was because people are being ripped off. So, so if stuff is being sold, I firmly believe that the artist should get their fair share of it. So I, I don't think the artist should be ripped off. But um, equally well, it's not uh, its not wrong that music should maybe be free. If music is completely free, that's different. Because now the artists aren't being ripped off necessarily. If, if music is free, well, music is free. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I don't think free solves anything either, by the way. But Because right. you know, actually, if you've, if you've got great music, um, people pay for it. And if you've got shitty music, people won't listen to it, even if it's free. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. So the, the, um, the price is slightly irrelevant. So we're running out of time. That's but, right. Uh, I wanted to just get a sense from you, because I, I recall Robert uh, posting something about planning tour dates through 2018. Is there a longer <laughs> timeline than, than that? Um, there's a longer timeline than that. I don't. There is no set end to this King Crimson. Huh. Uh, they, they were originally going, proposing to maybe take a break and then maybe start again. The break is no longer proposed. Mm. So um, I think over breakfast this morning, we were discussing what we might be doing in 2019. We don't have an answer to that, by right. the way, but uh, I do know what we're doing in 2018. I don't think I'm going to tell everybody, but uh, the, there is a full year's touring in 2018. Um, and um, so, uh, I mean, right now, with the you know, there's this tour, so there's the roughly it's a West Coast tour. I mean, let me zoom across to Chicago, so I don't know what you want to call it. But there's there's this half of a U.S. Mm. tour, um, and um, we still has tickets available. It is not totally sold out. <laughs> Let's get that in there. Um, but then uh, I think in the next couple of weeks we will be announcing an autumn run that ends in New York. So there's a um, roughly a, if, if this is the West Coast, then we're doing the, the oh. East Coast. Okay. Um, starting in Austin, just to confuse everybody about where the East Coast is. It's on a coast. <laughs> yeah, it's on a coast. <laughs> um, so so this this year is entirely US. It's two, tour, two tours in the US. Um, next year, I think, will be Europe and Japan. Mm. Oh, well, no, I know it will be Europe yeah. and Japan. <laughs> um, and um, 2019, we're excited to try and do South America always problematic mm. just in making it happen but we're excited to try and do South America and because that will be the 50th anniversary to do some radical ideas that I haven't had yet <laughs> um, I, I proposed the tour of London the other day and that might happen Wow! as in seven dates touring London so there is an exciting future. That's, uh, yeah, that's so, great. yeah the, the, this, is a, this is a band and awesome. I, think the, I think the band are up for it I think the eight pieces um, inexplicably Far, far better than the seven piece. I Bill can't Re wait to see him. Bill Rieflin will tell you which because he's in the band. I don't know, <laughs> but whatever it is, but it's, um, yeah, it, every year this band reinvents itself and gets better. So. That's awesome. Yeah. David, thank you That's so right. much for taking some time. That's I really okay. appreciate it. Great to right. you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.